Um, okay, thanks everyone for coming um, to this uh, session of the third day of Game Connection. Um, so I'm welcoming um, Chip Peterson from Concrete Games. He's and yeah. Oh, does, does the uh, I think the screen needs to be updated? Is that is there a button to press? Um, in any case, um, you've you probably noticed over the last few days that we have um, hashtags um, that allow you to um, tweet your question. So if you have a question for, for Chip that you want to tweet that we can cover during question time, the hashtag is uh, GCE006. It's not that one up there. That's Mark Albine from Ubisoft Montreal. I think 007 but one less. Yeah, so think James Bond minus one, I guess. Um, also, if there are any francophones here, um, 
you're very welcome to ask your question in, in French, and I will do my best to translate. So, um, thanks very much, Chip. Um, well, thank you very much. Happy Halloween to everyone. Is Halloween big here? Nah, big in the States, so. I dressed up like uh, Colonel Custer with this mustache for you today, so. Just to let you know, um, I'm a wanderer. I walk around, so uh, push the button. We'll get going here, maybe. All right, let's get a couple things out of the way. Um, this is the interactive talk. It's not a lecture. I'm not going to sit up here and spout down all the things I've learned in the world. I'm here to interact with you, talk with you, share with you what I've been doing over the last 20 years. So if you have questions, please ask them during the presentation. I've also saved time for after the presentation. Um, if you're really shy, you can send me an email. You can send me a tweet, too, and I'll reply to you. Because um, that's what I really like to do is help people. Because over the last 20 years, people have helped me, and I want to return the favor. Also, this presentation, so you don't have to worry about taking a bunch of notes, it's going to be on the Game Connection website. And also, I'll post it on my own website. So like all conferences, please silence your phone. You know, we'll put those away and remember to call your mom because she misses you. So, you're probably wondering who is this chip guy? Well, I'm located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, I like to call it Silicon Valley, uh, Silicon Prairie. Uh, very cold. Uh, that's why you get a lot of programming done there. As I said, I've been in the industry for over 20 years. Um, I've shipped over 100 titles. Um, I manage small teams, the smallest two, biggest 60. I manage teams locally. I manage teams all across the globe. Uh, I think at one time, at, as I said, I had 10 teams on seven different time zones, so that was really fun. So I'm going to talk about some of the tools that I use to work with these teams that you can work with your own teams. And if you're ever on Xbox, I'm that Apple. Um, these are some of the companies that I worked for. A lot of people always go chip. The icon's wrong for Apple. No, when I worked at Apple, that was the icon, so I'm old. Uh, so, some other things. iChart, here's some of the titles I worked on. Not up to date, but hooray for me. Um, team sizes. Um, if you read a little bit of my synopsis about what's going on in the industry right now and big teams going into small teams, and I want to talk about small team interaction and small game teams, little example. So I worked at Microsoft Game Studios for over eight years. At one time, uh, I had a game team that was, one of my teams was over 60 people. Uh, we were codenamed Cujo, and actually it's our 11 year anniversary today of shipping the very first Xbox hockey game, so Cujo for life. You'll probably see that hashtag a lot today. Um, marketing, I had no idea how big marketing was. I mean, we used to joke, marketing will take care of that. Marketing, lawyers, no idea. Tons of lawyers at Microsoft. I remember they had to come into my office to review the hockey game. There was three of them. There were uh, two men and a woman in their suits sitting on my futon, which I slept most of the time to get the game out. And they're sitting there looking at the game, reviewing it, which I thought was much strange. Localization, hundreds of people over in Cork, Ireland, doing all the localization. User testing, every night there was a user tester in our game. Can you believe that? Every single night, a team dedicated to doing user testing. After eight years, I went to Activision Minneapolis, where I'm home, where I'm from. I went from a team of 60 to a studio of 60. Kind of a small change for me. Marketing was one person. It was Steve. Instead of who's, marketing's do it, now it was Steve's doing it. We had one lawyer, too, and his name was Joe. And still friends with him today. Um, I went to Outdoor Partners, which was my own company. We had three full-time people. And then we outsourced everything to all across the world. So I was working with people all different sizes, as you can see, smaller, smaller, smaller. And now I work for Concrete Software, which is about 25 people, all in, uh, in, in one building, all devs, artists, QA, uh, production. And we also have our own analytics team for a mobile company. That's great. We have our own analytics system and our own data analysts and our own user acquisition people. So let's get right into it. What this talk is not about, and hopefully everybody doesn't leave right after this, but I'm not going to be talking about how to find funding, you know, how to find a publisher. Hopefully you can do that today here, or find, some, or find good people, projects, back end, or a coffee fetcher. 
you know, find an investor, find a lawyer, find someone else. You can probably find so many people here that can help you out. Um, and, you know, get your own coffee. And this is kind of tell you a little joke. When I first started at Apple, they were hiring a lot of IBM people to come work at Apple to help them understand the computer business. And the executive assistants were working there, and, and their manager would come to him and go, print off my email and get me a cup of coffee. And executive assistants at Apple went, screw you, get your own coffee. This is Apple. We don't do it that way. And so that taught me a lot. If, if you, you don't ask anybody to do something you can't do yourself. So especially with a small team, you're going to have to be doing a lot of stuff. So when I had my own company, I was making coffee. I was cleaning bathrooms. I was emptying the garbage. You do everything to make sure that place is running and make them working on the game. So what this talk is about, building, managing a successful game team, that's really what this is about. And most importantly, communication, working with the people, talking to them, understanding them, and learning what you can do and what you can't do. So you've probably all seen this, recent headlines, big companies, you know, laying off people, where do you go? You know, do you start your own business? Do you work for someone else? How do you get started? And the way I look at this, this is opportunity. This is the time. So when I came here in 2004 with Activision, it was a much different market. We were the gatekeepers. We, you had to work with a publisher to get your game out. We had to help you find money to get your development kits, help pay for your development, help pay for your team. Times have changed. Times have changed now. You can do your own game. You can help get it out there. You need to work together with a publisher now. You don't rely on them now. You need to work together. And Phil, uh, Sp Phil uh, Spencer from uh, Microsoft just recently said himself, we don't need another first-person shooter on Xbox. We need more Minecraft people. And I'm going to take it a, a step further, is you don't need a new Minecraft. You need something completely new. And that's, I bet the people in this room are going to make that happen. Because when I was here 10 years ago, I was sitting with House Martique and Red Lynx, and they were just small little teams, and they were showing me their games, and now they're launch titles on PS4 and Xbox One, or people have gone on and done their own mobile games that are totally successful and don't need a producer anymore. So you can do it. All right. So we're going to talk about these big questions as we go through, and I'll, I'm going to walk through each one of them. Do you have enough people? Do you have the right people? That's probably more important. Who's in charge? Who's actually in charge of the company and the project? Where are we going to be located? That's really big now. You know, before everybody was, you know, in an office. You know, remember John Romero? The first things he even didn't even ship a product, but they showed how beautiful his office was. Not anymore. You can work virtually across with teams and people from all over the world. How are you going to communicate is probably one of the biggest things. So let's break this down. Do you have enough people? Always a difficult question. So, drink water, sorry. Ah, thank you. Depends on your project. Is the project you're working on an idea that you have yourself? Do you have a team already that you're working on it? More importantly, is your game funded? Is somebody funding this for you? Have you been lucky enough to find a partner that's going to help you fund the money? Have you saved up your own money and you're going to take time off and invest it in a team and do it? Um, are you bootstrapping it? If you're bootstrapping it, you, may, you want to go small. So start out with just enough people to get you going. That may be depending on what you want to do. If you're following the lean uh, project starting, if it's just a minimum viable product, how many people do you need just to get that minimum viable product out? Or maybe it's just the demo you want to get out. That's the people you need. That's how many people you need. And also, it's very dependent on the next question. The next pack question is, do you have the right people? Because I've worked with people that are like geniuses, programmers that can do the work of 10 different programmers. If you have that person and they're working for you, it's going to maybe totally different. Or if it's your first game, it may be different. Or if you have someone just coming out of the university or a new artist or someone who's never been in gaming before, that's going to affect, you know, do you have the right people on the project? 
the way I look at it, you know, everyone has to have a specific role, especially at the beginning. Okay, you are our developer, you are our artist, you're our producer, you're, you're the one uh, doing biz dev for us. Everybody must have a role. I think of it as the life, I have skate pod, do people understand when I say the lifeboat drill? Have everyone gone through what the lifeboat drill is? Who's in the boat, who's not? You have to decide, or a balloon that's rising and it starts to sink. Who do you throw out of the balloon to keep the going? Usually it's Steve. Steve from marketing gets tossed out. But that's what I usually do. Who do I have to have in my lifeboat to get this project going? All right. Um, whoops. Now I figured out what all the buttons do. OK. Every person on your project has to be committed. This is the number one thing that I've faced in developing any game, a small game or a big game. You make sure that everybody is committed to the project. They're on board, they're gonna give it their all. I've recently went through this with my own company and had a couple people that were just like, eh, huh. got rid of them. If they're not, you got, it's, it's sad, but you gotta get rid of them because they will not help you move forward. You really need, um, the, everybody's on board. Okay, let's say you're, you're going, Chip, we're, we're, we are bootstrapping it. We all have full-time jobs. That's fine. But if someone says, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to dedicate 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week, make sure they're doing their 10 hours, 20 hours a week. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that, how to track that. And I'm not saying you have to track, you know, be a whip cracker on everything, but it's going to help you when you're understanding who's involved. Okay, I literally ask people, I'll pull them aside, are you in or are you out? And I recently had to do that three months ago and the person just went, I'm out. And I said, thank you for telling me the truth. And they're much happier now, we're happier now because we wanted everybody on board. Sometimes you have to do that, especially on a small team because you wanna make sure that you're successful. Remember that, sometimes you have to ask it. I put this in quotes because when I, I was working with a team in Canada and I would go to their office and visit them and their culture was incredible. It was so fun. I used to go up, my wife was like, why are you always going to Vancouver and working with these guys? And I said, it's so much fun there. I'm learning so much from these people. And I went to the owner and I said, you know, how do you keep this great culture? And he goes, Chip, we have a better firing policy than a hiring policy. And I was like, what? And he goes, Chip, with, we'll hire somebody, we'll give a person a chance. But if they don't work out within the first two weeks, we let them go. He goes, and I said, why are you doing that? And he said, we're protecting our culture. He said, you, you've talked about our culture, how great it is. We want to keep that. We don't, he goes, we don't want anybody poisoning our water hole, Chip. That's the way he explained it to me. So he goes, don't be afraid, bring somebody on. But if they're not working out, let them go. I know that sounds tough and hard, but you want to make sure if you're small, you want the right people on board all marching together with you. And I'm saying that they can't think different than, than you. They can't you know, raise questions. That's, that's, that's not what I'm saying, is that they're on the team, they're good for the culture, they're working with you. This is another tough one, when to expand. And then the question is buy versus grow. You know, some of you could be in different phases. Some of you may be starting out right now and just putting your teams together and trying to figure out what to do. So once again, go back a slide and we'll, you have the, the people you need right now to get your demo out, your minimal viable product out. And then, oh, we're starting to feel we need more people. You know, you're starting to feel that I can't do as much. You know, we're, we need another person. A um, good friend of mine told me, Chip, Always wait six months before you hire somebody because things can change with your project. Things could happen differently. You could lose your producer, your publisher. You could lose your partner. So if you can get by as long as you can get by, do it. And then after six months, if you're like, I still need that person, then you know. Next question always is, do I buy or do I grow? And what I mean by that is, do I spend the extra money for that artist, for that 3D animator, for that programmer? Or do I take a chance on somebody coming right out of the university who has an incredible portfolio or 
has an incredible game demo, and they're like, this person has potential. This person has potential and passion. Because once again, you have to protect your culture. You may bring in that person, which I've had, you know, we've, I've seen it before. You bring in that person who has a lot of industry experience, and they get there, and they're just like, I'm burnt out. You know, I've coded all this stuff before. I thought I was going to come here because I thought it was going to be easier. Wrong. It's not going to be easier. It's the same. Big game, small game. It's still hard. It's still hard work. So be sure to really check them out. And if they're worthwhile, though, I've seen it once again. If you pay that little bit extra, you get that stuff done faster. But I've also brought on new people, and they had just so much passion and had so much raw talent, and they wanted to learn so much. They were much better for the company. I've hired a lot of producers that had no game experience, but they're great at organization, great at communication. I can teach them the game stuff, but if they already know how to communicate, they already know how to work with people, follow up, boom, 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 they're going to take off. All right. Everybody doing okay? Everybody can hear me? Good. All right. All right. Who's steering the ship? This is always a tough one, especially if there's people in here who are just starting up their company. Sorry, everyone cannot be in charge. You need a captain. That is why ships have captains, because they point. You know, other people may be driving, but there's some people staying ahead going, all right, when we get up here, we're going to take a left. When we get up here, we're going to take a right. You need that person that's looking ahead, okay? If you don't work this out, you're going to have a problem. A great example, once again, worked with a company. Unfortunately, they had to do a big layoff. Five of the best people left, going to start their own game company. I'm like, right on, you guys are going to great, create great stuff. Well, they all said... They were five equal partners. That's fine. But when they started working on the project, all five of them had five different opinions and had to work through all five different opinions and changes all the time. And it sunk them. It took so much longer because they were battling among themselves. So early on, you have to decide who is steering this ship, who is going to help us. And next thing is, who is your, what I call, whipcracker cheerleader? And, you know, this is the person who's in charge of the project. And, you know, they go by many names. Don't kid yourself. You need somebody. You know, you need a producer. You need a project manager, scrum master, Bob, Nancy, Nicole, whatever. You need somebody. Okay? I fell into this trap myself when I first started my first studio. It's like, okay, we're doing two games. Rachel... You're on game one, and I'm on game two. That didn't work out. <laughs> because I was off trying to work with the client. I was trying to find money. I'm trying to do this stuff and that stuff. And the project started to suffer. So I mean, I didn't even follow my own advice. And I was wrong. So please listen to me. Need somebody running that project on a day-to-day -day basis who's leading that project, guiding that project. It's going to help you get to your goal. All right? So don't kid yourself going, oh, I can do both jobs. I can run the company and run the project. I don't think it's going to happen. Okay? Get somebody who's going to really be there every day. They can update you. You can meet with them every day. That's what I did with my producers. And we'll talk a little bit more, more about that coming up too. Location, location, location. Brick and mortar. This is your second biggest expense after people. So my suggestion is start small. If you, you, know, you can put together, do it in your living room. Storm 8, one of the biggest mobile companies right now, they started on the guy's living room. And they said it was great. It was a blast. They all sat on the couches. They got everything done. Then they got money, and then they slowly got a studio. You know, things are maybe different here. There's a lot of incubators. Last time I was here, there was a, they showed me a great incubator. Work with people. Work to share spaces. Uh, there's in, in the United States, there's a, a place called Coco in Minneapolis, for example, where you can uh, get a, a, a membership to go and you get free, free, free Wi-Fi, you get meeting rooms. You guys can all meet in that location. Find a friend who maybe has a business and say, hey, help us out. Let's just let me steal your Wi-Fi with my three people for a little while just to get by. We'll put you in the credits. Something. Barter, share, anything. You know, start small. 
BYOD, bring your own device. Equipment is so expensive these days now. You may have to start off and go, hey, you're on the team, but I need you to bring your computer. I need you to bring your phone. We're going to use your phone as a test device, too. You know, try to bring your own device. Does anybody know this one? BYOF. That's good. Bring your own friend. That was a good one. Yes. Okay, we'll, we'll accept that one because a lot of times friends also bring in the best people. That's my new one. Bring your own furniture. So when you're first steadying up, you first get your thing. Bring in your old furniture. Find it online. Bring it in. I actually recently did that at my, old, my own office. They had all office furniture, but they didn't have like couches and workspaces. And so unfortunately, my son was laid off. A graphic designer. Anybody need a graphic designer? Let me know. He's in my basement. Um, I took all his stuff, leather couches and, and things, brought them into the office. Now everybody's using them. They're hanging out in there. That's where they're, they're meeting. They're talking. They're hanging out. So bring your own furniture. Uh, set your space up the way you want it to set it up. Make it comfortable. If you have a virtual team, nothing wrong with that. But if you have a virtual team, act like you are in the same location. Have meetings every day. Use instant messenger. Use Skype. Use FaceTime. Every day, get online. Chat with them if you have a question. In my office, we have 25 people. We use IM all the time. Come over here. I got a question for you. Can you look at the screen? Zoop, 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 zoop. And just you can do that even in a virtual office. Hey, take a look at this. FaceTime. When I was working with all those different um, companies all around the world, I always wanted, they didn't have Skype, they didn't have FaceTime, we used to, uh, I don't even know what we used, we used the Xbox camera and all these things, anything, because I wanted to look them in the eyes, because I'll give you a really great example. So I was meeting, morning meeting with a company up in Canada, and I said, hey, can you guys get this feature done? I needed to take it to the licensor, they're having a special show, I need this feature in the game. Can you do it? Producer, Dev lead, yeah, we can do it. I'm like, hey, David, your mouth said yes, but your body said no. Can you really do it? And he's just like, I don't know, Chip. And I said, okay, what are we working on this week? We're working on this, 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 this. I'll trade you this for that for next week because we'll get this in. This is important, David, because if we're getting this in front of all the managers for Bass Pro Shop, who I was working with at the time, they're all going to be excited about the game. They're all going to be telling people about the game. And they're like, okay, we understand now. Now we know why it's important. We'll switch those things out. We can do it now. Now we're on the same page. Once again, communication, and us once again looking at their body language. Because you can misinterpret things in an email or IM. Talking face-to-face, -face, you can pick up on the body language. So, communication. George Bernard Shaw. Single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that has taken place. I have faced this so many times where people have said, hey, did you hear, you know, we're going to do this? What? Did you hear we're shipping this week? What? Did you hear we have to get this new advertisement out this week? What? No. So this is usually what game communication is like. It's Chewbacca, my favorite, but that's how it usually comes out. So here's mine. Success and failure game hinges on team communication. I believe that. If you're communicating together, you will be successful. If you're not communicating, you're in trouble. And by communication, I mean real true communication. Okay? Smaller team, misnomers. You know, this, you know it's going to be easier to communicate because we're, we're a small team. Wrong. It doesn't matter the size of your team. If you're not talking to each other, you're still going to have problems. Great example, I was working with a company and they had, we were working on the AI for a hockey game. And the developer's like, don't, you know, the head AI guy has got it going. I'm like, did you talk to him? Yeah, I talked to him. No, 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 did you tell him? And we'd get a build and it, we wouldn't see any improvement, any improvement. We're like, what's going on? You, and they're like, I finally just set a deadline. I go, by Friday, we have to have a working demo, seeing the AI. And that Friday came and they was like, we don't have the AI in place. I said, why? The developer went off and on his own. He disassembled the whole AI and tried to re-put it back together and couldn't do it. 
And I'm like, why didn't you communicate with him and tell him? Well, I thought if I left him alone, he would get it done. No, you can't leave anybody alone. You got to check in. And, I'm, and it's not micromanaging. I'm just saying, how are things going? Is the AI okay? Are you okay? Check with them on it. This is the other one I always see too, is, oh, we've worked together before. You remember? We were all at Microsoft. We left. We came here. We'll all be on the same page. Wrong. Because once again, you may be that small team, three people, five people that worked together before, and you're like, ah, oh, okay, I'm going to write the AI. Somebody else thinks they're writing the AI. And suddenly you got two people writing the AI. No, you can't have that happen. You have to be on the same page. You have to have everybody doing a specific thing. And you think, that would never happen to me. It's happened. All right? Or the project is smaller. I love this one. The project is smaller, so it'll be easier to track everything. Wrong, 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 wrong. It doesn't matter the size of the project. It's never, it's never easier. It's never, ever easier. OK? So communication. This is one of my big ones, and I learned this. Everyone, great ideas come from everywhere. When I was working on the hockey game 10 years ago, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, the control scheme came from the art team. They knocked on my door and said, Chip, we've been playing around with this other game, and we have an idea for the hockey game. And so what it was was with your right hand, you controlled the skater, and with your left hand, you controlled where he passed. So hockey is, if you people know hockey, you can be skating in one direction and pass in another. So using the two sticks back in the dark ages was new, and we were the first game to do that, and that came from the art team. And after that, everybody was like, and I said, doors always open, great ideas. So everybody felt involved. They felt part of the game. They felt like they were part of, not, I'm not just doing this art portion, I'm doing everything. I'm really helping this game. Start the week off. This is if you're a virtual team or you have a local team off. All hands meeting. Every Monday, have an all hands on meeting. This is the way I do it. I have shout outs. And they go by many different names. Shout outs is the new one for my new company. I used to have roses and hoses. I used to have stars of the week. But you recognize somebody for doing something above and beyond. And depending on the team I was, they had a different trophy. We had the Stanley Cup in one case. Another one, we had Shaq's shoe. This one just turned out to be Sackboy from PlayStation. And people are just all excited. At first, they're like, why am I getting this? Now, every week, they're like, who's getting Sackboy? Who's getting Sackboy this week? Hot lists. That's the list of priorities for going out this week. These are the top things that we're working on this week. Everybody knows about them. If there's any changes in priority, Okay, these are the top things we have to get done this week. Everybody knows it. Any updates? Okay, we, we're working on a game right now for um, the PBA, which is a professional bowling league. They're having a tournament this weekend. We have to make sure we have their banners done. We have to make sure we have the new bowling balls out. Is everybody on top of that? Yes, okay. Uh, they sent new ad copy. Does, do you have the new ad copy? Yes, good. Keep going. Changes. Good example. Ad copy changes. What are our goals for a week? What are our stretch goals? What are we trying to push for? Right away at the beginning of the week, everybody knows what's going on. They're all standing there. We're all together. We all agree. We all break. But it doesn't stop there. It goes backwards in time. Status reports. And you're probably going, oh, thank you. I'm right at the end. <laughs> you're probably going, oh, Chip, no status reports. Hold on to that thought for a minute. Individual one-on-ones. Meet if you're the producer or you're the dev lead or whoever you are. If you're the owner, make time to meet with every person every single week. You're going to learn so much stuff. And when I say make it a priority, don't miss it. Don't skip it. Don't plan a meeting over it because then the people will not think it's important either and they won't prepare for it. They won't believe in it. They won't think it's going to happen. This is your time every single week that you're going to meet with that person and dedicate it to that. I suggest if you are, haven't used it or start using some sort of agile process, iteration, it's been great for us. Also use collaborative software, especially in a virtual environment. Google Docs, Asana, Jira, um, Basecamp, set up a wiki, set up your own. 
You can do it yourself. There's so many tools out there that you can do because you can share all this stuff. I'm actually working on docs with people back at home because we're trying to ship another game. I can see the latest. They can see my comments. I can see their comments. It's perfect. And that's why I say these are more than tools. These are weapons. These are the weapons that are going to allow you to, to finish your game. This is where the kick-ass comes in fart. You're using these tools, using your one-on-ones and your, start, uh, your status reports to keep your project moving forward and to understand what's going on. So status reports, mine are very, very basic. The top of it is how are things going, the gut feeling. If you notice, I don't ask how the project is going or how you are going. I just ask how are things going. This is probably the most important paragraph that I read every single week from my people, because they will tell me, I'm scared. I don't think we're going to ship on time. I'm worried about this. So-and-so is not showing up. I mean, they, after it takes about two weeks, three weeks, and then they start trusting you with it, because I only see these status reports. I don't share them with anybody. They're just between us. I learned so much of what's going on within the company and the people by reading that portion there. Then I have, I asked them, what tasks have you completed this week? And what tasks are you scheduled for next week? And people are like, ah. Uh. And I'm like, watch this. Tell them to put it together. And then I go, look what happens next week. You take the things that you did, they switch around, and it becomes a to-done list. Suddenly they're like, oh, wow, I'm tracking all my stuff. I see what you're doing here now, Chip. You tricked us. It's actually a to-do list, and they're checking things off, and they don't forget things then. And they're going, wow, I'm getting so much stuff done. Review time comes around, and they want to ask, what did you do? They have it all there tracked out for them every single week, what they did. So they love this. And then I ask them what are risks, what are dependencies they're working on, and then key dates. And that key date could be a shipping date, it could be a milestone date, could be vacation, could be they're getting married, could be time off. I need to know that. And everybody knew. We can share it so we know, hey, Nicole's not going to be here. What are we going to do? All right? So, very, very quick. Thank you very much. I hope this helps you with, any, with your, uh, your teams and projects. I hope you have questions. Please ask them right there. Okay. Hi. Hi, Chip. Uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering for small teams, uh, you, you know, usually in a small team, the person who becomes the head of the studio doesn't have a business background. It's, you know, graphic artists, uh, developers, so on and so forth. And they usually would try to do, uh, they're bootstrapping and they would try to do what they're really good at. And they try to do on top of that, this management role. Uh, how do you suggest one can deal with it without being overwhelmed because often you see that they are overwhelmed. There's just no time to do anything. Uh, I think a boil your question down is so if people didn't hear it is maybe they're, someone's coming in, running the company, they came from art, but now they have to deal with the business side of it and they don't have experience in that. And, two, and they're doing two jobs. Yes. I've had that problem. I'm not a business guy. So... What I did was find people who I know who are good in business and help, help mentor me. And I got to that one point where, once again, I was like, do I need to bring somebody on actually to do this to get to a certain point? But until I, I couldn't, I would work with people and have them mentor me and say, help me with these decisions. And luckily, you know, I, I have people from many different areas, of, you know, not just game business, but like, hey, how would you handle this situation? I asked for help. I literally asked for help, and that's how I would do it, and then start to balance it. And maybe you find somebody else within the group, too, that maybe they, hey, you're actually better at this than me. Maybe you can do this. Maybe you can take this on. And so I hope that helps. Okay? Okay, um, we'll have Attention you then here. Okay, just ignore that. Stay here. 
Hi, Chip. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm Paulo, a founder of a Brazilian game studio, and I'm very interested in the one-on-one -on -one part. Okay. I do that with my team. I used to do that with my team, uh, like half an hour, which uh, every couple months, something like that. But uh, as the studio grew uh, and I left production, I was more like running the company. Right. Uh, I now don't know uh, for sure like what exactly they're doing. It's hard to keep track of all that. And I, I have a hard time providing feedback to them because I'm not uh, right. like close to them in a daily basis. Uh, what would you suggest for this kind of situation? Do you have somebody that has taken over your role in doing the one-on-ones? Do you have that? In place? Uh, no, uh, I have someone that took over my place as a product owner for the for the products for the projects. Okay, uh, but not on the one on one. That person is not really good in HR skills. Okay, um, do you have leads on the team that maybe meet? I mean, how big is your company? We're twenty people. Twenty? Yeah, twenty people. Um, I would look to find that person who is a lead that could take over that role, and then. Or if you have the time, say, hey, you know what? I feel like I'm not, uh, I don't have the one-on-ones that I used to have with you before. I feel like I don't know what's going on with the company. The company is so important to me. I'd like to start doing them again and see, try to work them back in. Um, or um, another thing I did was spread it out among the team. And then I would have a smaller meeting with those leads and say, hey, what's going on? Because if you can't meet with them all the time and meet with them once a week or twice a week or when you can and, and form that leads team. So form a leads team within your group and then that team can communicate up to you if you're too busy. And that's, I've done both of those things and it helps out a lot. So Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about sharing the resources. Uh, do one producer can work on more than one project and can artists work on many projects? What do you think about sharing resources between the teams? It depends on the person. I've had, um, I worked with producers before who have managed three projects and I worked with one producer who could only manage one. That's just, um, he was young, working his way up. The other person, Rachel, could juggle three processes. Same with an artist. Some artists, arts, and developers, it doesn't matter. It depends on the person. They, some do better juggling, some don't. So I would actually ask them. And right now, our artists juggle between three different games, and they like it because they're like, one day I get to do this, I want to switch my brain out, I want to do that. So I would work with them, ask them to see if they do it. What I would do is test it give them a little bit at a time to see if they can do it and if they can handle it. And then you can say, okay, and tell them it's a test. Because I go, I just want to see if you can handle it. Um, and they'll take it on as a challenge them themselves. And then if you, you work closely with them, they can say, hey, I'm, you know, I can't do it. Or they're saying, I'm doing great. And they're growing. Then you've helped them actually grow. So I would work with those people individually and try to do a little bit more with them and grow. Does that help? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. One in the back. Hi, thank Hi. you very much. Uh, I'm the founder of BioGames, which is a new uh, French studio. And uh, as a former creative director and with a business background, I'm still very embarrassed uh, holding the creative position. Uh, I, I would like to know what you think about that. Um, so you're the founder of the company and you, you're also doing the creative direction? Yeah, I'm the CEO and the creative director, and I think I'm going to be a bottleneck at some point. And that's good. Right there, you just, you're on the right track. You're already worried that you may be a bottleneck. And most people are the, the problems are the people that are like, no, it's not going to be a problem. I can do this. I can do this. So at least you're thinking I may become a, a bottleneck in the future. So to, to be honest, when I started Outdoor Partners, I was you know, president, but I never went by president. I always went as creative director because that's where I really thought I helped more was going around and saying, this is what we need to do on this game. This is the vision. These are the key pillars and get that team excited and then go to the next team and keep them excited. And then when I got to a point where I couldn't do that anymore, I handed it off or, or I grew somebody up. I groomed somebody to say, hey, you know what? You're going to have to be doing this for me. 
But the great thing, as you said, is you're recognizing it already. I worked with a lot of people who were like, I have to do this, I have to do this. And I, I give another speech on leadership, and I'm, I talk about, no, you have to learn to be able to trust the people you're working with, give them the opportunity to do it themselves. So, so sorry, just to sum up, to make sure I'm, uh, I'm really clear. You, what you're saying, basically, is that when you're the CEO of the company, you can't be part of the core team of the project. Uh, it's, it's a tough question because I don't know your project. And don't, on my, on PC, uh, PC MMO, so... Well, it depends on the game, how intense the game is, how, you know, who your partners are. I was able to do it to a point, and then I realized I could not do it anymore, and then I handed it off to somebody else. Especially if your small team is starting up, you have to wear many hats. So to get through rough times, you may have to wear many hats to get through it, then hopefully, but at the same time, maybe you're training something, you're a growing person, you're like, hey, this is what I'm doing. I need you to start thinking about this. I need you to start running this meeting and going forward. So then you can step away and the team is in a good spot because you have somebody solid there to back you up. That would be my suggestion. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Chip, for the presentation. Thank you. I have a question regarding the hiring process because there is a time where you can hire somebody or you can outsource it. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, we're going through that right now, um, for example. Um, we just picked up a new game. Uh, it's going to be very intensive 3D. And we have one 3D person on it. And so what we're going to do is outsource the models. So we're going to get the basic models. This is something, once again, I learned from another partner who said, Chip, we outsource 80% of the work. And then so the people here working are working on the 20%. They're working on the shine. They're working on that bling polish part. So for example, we're going to outsource to get an animal model. And so the basic model. But we're going to bring it in, and, our, and then our animator is going to put the animation on it, put the textures on it. And so sometimes you do have to outsource. or. I've brought people in on contracts because we just because I didn't want to bring them on full time and then lay them off and just say this it's a month to month contract I only need, can, need you for a month and then if it goes well you're like hey do you want to stay another month another month another month and it can then turn into full time but I'm honest up front and I'll say I only got enough money for one month and I need this and you know do you want to do it and they'll be yes or no you know so. I don't, there's nothing I, wrong with outsourcing. It's great if you can uh, find a great partner, though. You've got to find a great partner. And once again, use everything I just told you with that outsourcer. Okay. Communicate with them. Talk to them. It really helps. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, we have time for perhaps one or maybe two more questions, if there's anyone else. If not... As I said, get a hold of me online. Grab me while I'm here. Thank you very much. Have a great show. This is a great show. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And um, make sure you um, use that strange-looking machine out there. That's for um, evaluating um, this session. Big thanks. Thank you.